Okay, this webinar is being recorded. We are live now. We're trying to go live on Facebook. Hello and welcome everybody. I'm gonna give a few more seconds for people to sign in and then we will start our program. And Betsy, are we live on Facebook? It's unfortunately pushing me to my account. So I, um, I'm trying to make that happen right now. I don't know why. No problem. <laughs> See if I can push it over. Well, in the meantime, I am going to get this show started. Hello and welcome everyone to the sixth in SUNY Optometry's Race in Optometry webinar series. My name is Dr. Joy Harewood and I am the Chief Diversity Officer at SUNY College of Optometry. As you know, the Race and Optometry series started as an opportunity for us to discuss issues of race and ethnicity in optometry as we strive to be a more diverse and inclusive profession. Subsequent conversations have shifted towards accountability to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable for some of the things that we suggested that we, we do in order to become more inclusive and more diverse. However, today's conversation will be very different because we are in a very different time. There's significant anti-DEI legislation that would restrict the way that we're able to pursue our goals of having better representation within our field. So tonight, we're here to discuss those barriers, their potential impact, and maybe how we can move forward in our efforts to be more diverse, more inclusive in our profession. It's important for me to say that the opinions expressed in this webinar are the personal views of the individual presenters and do not necessarily reflect the, way the positions the of the institutions they represent or at which they are employed. I also wanna acknowledge that there were some people who wanted to be panelists in this webinar who were not able to because the current legislative efforts made it uncomfortable for them to speak freely. Now, we have to acknowledge what a shame it is that we do not have their voices represented, but we will continue to push forward. So to start our conversation, I'm gonna bring on the three panelists who are gonna give us an overall idea of the legislative climate, the political climate that we're operating in today. I'd like to welcome Professor Kathy Northern, who's the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence and Jones Day, Robert M. Duncan, designated Associate Professor of Law at The Ohio State University. Wendy Ravitz, who is the Chief Campus Counsel at SUNY College of Optometry, and Dr. Ruth Shoge, who's the Director of DEIB at the Herbert Berthein School of Optometry and Vision Science, otherwise known as Berkeley Optometry. So let's jump right in. Let's briefly outline, if possible, the two cases addressing racially conscious admissions that are being decided at the Supreme Court at this time. Let's speak a little bit about what impact they may have on the admissions process. And I'm going to move things over to Professor Northern to get us started. Well, and I'm going to move things to, <laughs> to Wendy. Wendy? Right, Wendy. Yeah. Have decided, divided up some of her comments. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Take it away. Thank you both. So before we get to the two cases that are poised to be released by the Supreme Court, I want to give you a quick rundown of the Supreme Court Affirmative Action Jurisprudence, which has basically brought us where we are today. I'm gonna to start with a brief discussion of the seminal case of Bakke versus University of California. That case was in 1978. Alan Bakke, a white man, applied to admission to UC Davis Medical School. That school reserved 15 spots out of 100 for qualified minority applicants. Bakke was denied admission despite having higher test scores and admitted minority applicants. He sued the university, arguing that the, the admissions process was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court ruled that the quota program used by UC Davis violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. However, the court also ruled that colleges and universities do in fact have a compelling interest in formulating a diverse student body and were able to use race as part of a holistic approach in making admissions decisions. In essence, the court said that race could be used as a plus factor in the decision-making process. That was where things stood for about 25 years until 2003, when um, Barbara Grutter, a white woman, at the an applicant to the University of Michigan Law School, sued the law school. The law school 
used race as a factor in the evaluation of an individual's application. It argued that its consideration of race as just one factor among others was narrowly tailored to address the compelling interest of achieving diversity in a student body and working towards achieving a critical mass of students from racial and ethnic minority groups. Justice O'Connor speaking for the court held that the Equal Protection Clause did not prohibit the law school's narrow and individualized use of, race, use of race as one of many factors in a holistic process. It also reaffirmed Bakke's finding that achieving diversity was a compelling state interest. But Justice O'Connor observed that race conscious admissions policy should be limited in time and stated that the court expected that 25 years later, the use of racial preferences should no longer be necessary. That statement by Justice O'Connor garnered much attention in the briefs submitted and an oral argument um, in the recent Supreme Court cases. And just briefly, I'm going to touch on one more case, Abigail Fisher versus University of Texas 2016. The University of Texas used an admissions process that automatically admitted Texas applicants who graduated in the top 10% of their class. Those seats took up 75% of each freshman class. For the remaining 25%, the university used a variety of factors, including race. Ms. Fisher sued after being denied admission, asserting that the university should not be permitted to consider race at all in the admissions process. The Supreme Court upheld Grutter and the principle that diversity is a compelling interest permitting schools to consider race as one factor in their admissions processes. So that's where things stood until, um, until uh, just a few years ago when the student, a group called the Students for Fair Admissions sued both Harvard and the University of North Carolina in two separate cases. The, the group, the Student for Fair Admissions was established in 2014 by a group of students, parents, and others who believed that racial classifications and preferences in college admissions were unfair, unnecessary, and unconstitutional. Both cases involve challenges to the institution's undergraduate admissions programs and seek to overrule Grutter. In both cases, the group argued that the schools discriminated against white and Asian American applicants during the admissions process by giving preference to Black, Hispanic, and Native American applicants. But the Harvard case went even further. There, the group claimed that the university affirmatively, affirmatively discriminated against Asian American applicants. The issue in both cases is whether the consideration of race and ethnicity in the college admission process constitutes a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. The constitutional claim applies to UNC as a public institution, and the Title VI claim ap applies to Harvard as a excuse me, as a recipient of federal funds. Both institutions do consider race as one of their many factors in the admissions process, alongside such, such other things as extracurricular activities, socioeconomic background, military veteran status, et cetera. Both colleges also assert that their attempts to use race neutral ways of achieving diversity had not been successful, and that therefore their consideration of race was narrowly tailored to achieve the compelling interest in the educational benefits of diversity. Oral arguments in this case were held in October, 2022. We expect a decision tomorrow, most likely, or Friday at the latest. Thank you so much for that. Professor Northern, would you like to comment on that or maybe some of the other legislative efforts that are, that are down the pike? Good evening, everyone. I think um, first in terms of what we're potentially expecting uh, in the next two days uh, to come from the um, Supreme Court, I think there are a range of possibilities. And so much of the uh, that, that range and, and how the court articulates its opinion is gonna be um, crucial to understanding kind of what next steps are, where, where, where we go from here. So um, it, the court could just decide the facts of the case before it and decide that um, either Harvard or North Carolina uh, failed to adopt um, racially neutral alternative means in order to diversify their class and so that they are therefore um, uh, out of compliance with Greta and that their 
um, those individual um, cases have merit. And arguably the court could go no further and just say that, yes, these, these two institutions uh, failed to do what we told people to do in, in Grutter. Frankly, uh, there are very few of us that anticipate that the court is going to leave it there. Uh, I think most um, of the argument, the oral arguments focused on um, the inappropriateness from the uh, petitioner standpoint of the use of race at all. The questions that the court um, focused on were in some ways attempting to distinguish between uh, admissions decisions that were basically checkoff boxes, that if you saw that someone had indicated that they were um, a uh, either African American or Hispanic or Native American. That um, that was the um, kind of determining factor in whether they were admitted, uh, without regard to other factors that both schools indicated were played a role. The petitioners assert that really people are actually just using a checkoff box, and that that checkoff box is. Um, impermissible. So the court could um, say that uh, the, uh, especially as we approach the 25 year mark um, that Justice O'Connor talked about uh, in Gruder, that we are we're actually what, 23 years out, uh, and um, that since universities have, and colleges haven't demonstrated that they can actually comply with Gruder. Uh, in a satisfactory way that race and uh, ethnicity uh, are just out as considerations. And then the question becomes, what does it mean to be out as a consideration? Is it um, just that universities have to prove that they're not using race and ethnicity uh, in a checkoff kind of way? So that could just involve kind of masking what race and ethnicity are uh, in terms of an application checkoff box, but still being allowed to take into consideration um, statements by students that indicate the role that race and ethnicity has played in their own experience, in their own uh, life, in the way that they, um, in, in what they will bring to the college or university in, uh, in ways that are specific to that individual and not just saying a person who is a member of the African-American race is going to bring diversity in a lot of ways just because they are, uh, which seems to be the petitioner's um, sense of what uh, is going on. And, and many of the questions from the court seem to um, actually address the plaintiff by saying, or the petitioners by saying, so would you preclude the use of these kind of um, experiential statements? And the petitioner said, no, that would be ex um, acceptable. So I think that the, really the crux of it depends upon whether the court um, decides just specifically to these uh, to the parties, whether the court says, no, it's really just the checkoff box that we're concerned about and other considerations are available, or if the court goes so far as to um, say from a majority standpoint that um, Baki, Gruder, that whole line of precedent is no longer good law and um, Concerns about diversity and having a diverse student body are not, in fact, compelling interest of a university, and so therefore undercut um, many things that are based or you know on efforts to um, uh, to support a diverse uh, educational a student body and therefore a diverse workforce in a wide range um, of, of contexts, in, in, including optometry and, and law and others. Um, so much of what the impact of these cases will depend significantly on the specific language that the court uses to articulate its opinion. And to some extent, um, I could anticipate there being uh, both concurring and dissenting opinions. And often those opinions are used to signal um, uh, additional, uh, are, you know, other ways people could think about it or arguments or kind of what comes next. So this mm -hmm. case is about admissions. It's not about other things. 
the court is probably going to limit, I, I shouldn't say probably, I shouldn't predict, could just limit its discussion to admissions decisions at that level. Uh, and then we would get a hint from other opinions, kind of the next step that the court would be willing um, to take if you know, faced with the fact pattern. Now, I'd like us to briefly touch upon some of the anti-DEI legislation that we have in the country, and I, I leave that either to Wendy or to Professor Northern, and then I would definitely like to get to Dr. Shoge after that. Okay. Just briefly, as many um, people know that there is uh, there are probably about 15 states now that have some form of um, DEI restrictive legislation um, pending or in the case of Texas and Florida, have been signed into law by the governor. The um, extent of the restrictions and what's being restricted can vary significantly from state to state, uh, but certainly include um, admissions, uh, decisions, um, and arguably scholarship and other, a range of other kinds of DEI practices and services within the um, legislation, depending upon, uh, they vary, the, the terms vary from state to state and are often a product of negotiation within a particular legislative body, uh, what it will take to get the governor to sign. And so um, what we will see happening under those legislations is just kind of yet to be seen, but something um, for everybody to really pay close attention to because um, while the Supreme Court decision is just focusing on admissions, those legislative efforts are much broader. I'd say you also might anticipate, as similarly as to Florida, that there may very well be judicial challenges uh, in the different states um, to various aspects of the legislation. So it's, in a sense, a story um, where we're in the first chapters and the rest remain to be, to, to be written. Thank you for that. Now, California is a state where some of these things have been in place for quite some time. And Dr. Shoge, that is where you currently practice and are a senior level diversity officer. Can you speak a little bit about that particular piece of legislation and maybe the impact it's had on your work? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Harewood. Um, and thanks for hosting this important conversation in our optometric community. Um, I think we're all very much holding our breath for the next couple of days to see what the outcome of these decisions are going to be. And I was recently at a conference um, where I, you know, interacting with a lot of different people from all over the country. And um, this was the biggest topic of, at, at, at hand, of course. And I said, well, you're in California, so you're safe from all of these anti uh, DEI legislation and and affirmative action things. I was like, <laughs> let me show you the California receipts. So California has had in place for 25 years now what's called Proposition 209 or Prop 209 for short. So we have for over a couple of decades now not been able to use race, ethnicity, or sex in the decisions for admissions um, into um, any of the public schools, so the University of California school system, the California State University school system. Um, we can't um, um, save seats. We can't apply scholarships specifically based on race, ethnicity, and sex. Um, and this also goes into faculty and staff hiring as well. We cannot factor those um, um, descriptors or, or demographics into the decision on whether someone can be admitted or hired or not. And so, um, unfortunately, we've seen this playbook and we've seen the ramifications and we're still trying to come out from under it all of these years later. And California saw in the first year after this legislation went into an effect in 1998, um, they, their my, uh, minoritized uh, student population went down by 50%. So this is not a small um, thing that we're talking about here. And in time, have been trying to recover those numbers. But what we're seeing is the gap between 
um, the number of eligible high school graduates, for example, in certain groups, and those that actually um, are admitted and start school continues to widen. Um, so, you know, we're unfortunately not a, a safe state, as some people like to say, and we've seen this play before, and we've seen the amount of work that we've had to put in um, to um, use race neutral um, um, policies and, and actions in order to continue to create a diverse um, student body and faculty body, not just because it's good for the schools, it's because it's good for society um, that we continue to do so. Um, there is still compelling interest um, to have diversity, particularly when you start to talk about healthcare, um, why it's so important to have diverse student bodies and ultimately diverse um, uh, doctor population. Thank you so much for that. I think that really sets the stage for our optometric organization. So I'm going to bring on next to speak a little bit about the efforts that are going forth and potentially how there is a response to some of this. I'd like to introduce Dr. Melissa Contreras, who's the Assistant Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Marshall B. Ketchum University. She is a member of the DEIB Committee and is representing the American Academy of Optometry. I'd like to introduce Dr. Terry Gossard, who's a trustee at the American Optometric Association, where she is the chair of their DEI committee. Again, we have Dr. Larry Jones, who is the president of the National Optometric Association. We have Dr. Jeanette Pepper, who is the chair of the Diversity and Cultural Competency Committee at the Association of Schools and Colleges of Optometry. And we have Dr. Adam Ramsey, who's the co-founder of Black Eye Care Perspective. So we have a lot of power in the room. Given that we are facing these anti-DEI efforts and this legislation, how does an organization respond or how do we move through this? And to start us off, I'd like to ask um, Dr. Contreras to, to give some comments. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Harwood. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm here representing the Academy and let me start by kind of framing that, right? Because when we think about admissions, the Academy is sort of after you've graduated from, you know, your school and college of optometry. And so where do we fit into that conversation? So as, as many of us know, most of us know the Academy is an organization, right? That prioritizes vision research and lifelong learning. We all go to our Academy meetings and have so much fun in camaraderie together and learning together, right? In order to advance the high level of care provided by our fellows at the Academy. Because ultimately the desire is to improve patient health outcomes through that learning and application in the care we provide, right? So you think of the Academy as this organization. So while we aren't involved in admissions, we will be impacted by the decision as an organization and as optometrists, right? Because achieving health equity and clinical excellence requires diverse perspectives, values, and insights, and any barrier to increasing the diversity of our workforce, as Dr. Shoge mentioned, is gonna delay progress in achieving health equity. And then the thing is that we have evidence that shows how diversity, equity, inclusion efforts are making healthcare better for everyone, patients and providers included, right? Things like workplace diversity associated with improvements in quality of care, patients' perceptions of care, improving when they see providers that are cultural, that have cultural humility and provide culturally responsive care. And then evidence that does show that implicit bias is associated with disparities in care. So I know, you know, we're all working and rowing in the same direction towards better patient better patient outcomes. And so many prominent national health organizations have pointed to the importance of workplace diversity. And yet when we look at many of the conversations across the country about this and about, you know, how do we get there a, a more diverse workforce and potentially how that Supreme Court decision will affect admissions sort of undergraduate and then and then in the schools and colleges of optometry, the downstream impact on the healthcare workforce and public health is missing from the picture. So when we think about how is it gonna impact us as organizations, it, you know, we're starting at the beginning and we're gonna feel the effects down the line. So while the push to undo the progress that, you know, these anti-DEI legislations are, are, are making, right? In certain, in many places is really disheartening. As the Academy, we're not dissuaded from making progress as an organization. That being said, the Academy has increased our efforts to make the organization a more diverse and inclusive place over the past several years so that optometrists and vision scientists from all backgrounds have a place and a space of belonging and know that they're welcome and valued, right? 
It's written into our strategic plan and resulted in our DEIB committee, who's currently working on how to make our conference more diverse, inclusive, and accessible. So that's really exciting. Um, in the video that, I, that you shared, our leadership's not only been intentional in diversifying our committees, but in creating opportunities for underrepresented communities to bring their ideas and expertise to academies, programs, and special interest groups. And then one I can speak to in particular is the newest creation of the SIG, or special interest group, um, focused on the care of Latinx, Hispanic, and Chicanx communities, which I'm really excited to participate in. So all that said, the Academy is going to continue its efforts and support the schools and colleges in their efforts to increase the diversity of our students at the healthcare education level, because ultimately, as I know we will all touch on, it's going to impact our organizations moving forward. Absolutely. I'd like to turn things to Dr. Gossard. You know, the American Optometric Association obviously represents people all across the country with all sorts of different ideas and politics. And so how does how do how do you sit or fit within this conversation? Sure. No, I appreciate the the platform and, and the opportunity and certainly all the work that that SUNY has done over the past years to bring these issues to the forefront. You know, as we were considering the specific type of conversation we're having today, I asked our state government relations chair to go back and give me a landscape of what's going on across the country with respect to state legislation. And during the 2023 cycle, 37 anti-DEI bills have been introduced across the country. And as of today, five of these bills have already been signed into law. As, and as, as Dr. Northern and Wendy were talking about, you know, it's in North Dakota, Tennessee, two in Florida, and of course, most recently in Texas. And as it's already been said, you know, these initiatives are primarily focused on state agencies and state funded higher education with the impact directed at defunding DEI programs in higher ed or prohibiting the use of DEI policies and hiring um, decisions. That said, from the AOA's perspective, you know, the impact might not be directly at us, but there is a lot of secondary fallout that happens because of this type of legislation that goes on throughout the country. You know, certainly, first and foremost, our legislative allies, we have to reevaluate them. Uh, depending on the political makeup of the legislature, and, and we all know that typically more conservative legislators and legislatures are introducing this type of, of bill, an OD-friendly legislator, they could make themselves a target for sponsoring and supporting this type of bill. And if this were a negative for said legislator due to any number of factors, their ability to sponsor our or champion our legislation could be significantly impacted and ultimately changing the game plan for any state association. The other concern is just bandwidth, the appetite of the legislature. Um, as with any major piece of legis legislation, especially those like this with social impact and focus, the willingness and opportunities of a legislator to take up other issues may be more limited whether it's reproductive rights or gun legislation or DEI, issues like these take up a lot of bandwidth, time, effort, and focus of the legislative body. And depending on the length of a state session and when a bill like this is being heard, opportunities for major optometric legislation, like some of our vision plan protection or scope of practice bills, may be limited or even non-existent. But to the point that Melissa was making, we have serious concerns as far as the workforce. Um, states who enact this anti-DEI legislation could find themselves in a position where graduates and soon-to-be graduates from schools and colleges of optometry choose not to relocate or to set up practice in those states. We even are running into issues of whether um, doctors want to lecture at optometry's meeting if it's in one of these states. And lastly, while state-funded universities are the primary target for anti-DEI legislation, the makeup and operating protocols for state boards of optometry are very much in the crosshairs for this type of legislation as well. So um, we're certainly aware of all the secondary impacts and, and, and to, I think it was, I can't remember which attorney was advising us and making us smarter, but that the opinions and the recommendations that come out after the Supreme Court rule. So we're incredibly focused on that. So with that end, you know, as always, we, the AOA is going to work to make sure that all citizens of the United States have access to all services by doctors of optometry. And we know that we will serve our patients better when we reflect our patients' makeup. 
Thank you for that. And to piggyback on that, I mean, that's a perfect segue to speak with Dr. Larry Jones, president of the NOA, in terms of responding and thinking about these things. We do know that the NOA convention this year is where? In Florida, somewhere where there's significant anti-DEI legislation. So that, among other aspects of this conversation, as the leader of the the organization that represents minoritized optometrists and patients, how do you how do you respond or navigate the conversation? So that's a great question. We, um, you know, we we have uh, there's pushback in in black organizations right now to go to Florida, and um, number one being the NAACP. I am a card carrying member, by the way, um, but it's important that we realize the reasons why people are saying, you know, avoid Florida, you know, why is this? Um, We know that Broward County um, and and Dr. Ramsey can actually, you know, back me on this. I think it's 30% black. Um, the, the, The people in the county, as well as Fort Lauderdale area, and we know even as people go to um, Disney, which is, uh, I think it's probably that area is in the twenties in the percentage of people of color. Um, when, when we go to Florida as an organization, we need to be aware of the issues facing the people of color in Florida. And unfortunately the state government has itch- issued kind of a draconian measure almost um, to create a barrier to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So to me, it's almost an assault on the First Amendment. If you look at the, the freedom of speech and and the right to speak and write and share ideas and opinions without facing punishment from the government, these are laws that were created for all of us. And if you if, as we're being limited in a way to speak and to speak out, as, as we train and we work together, I think it's crucial to make changes in in that area that we can that we can be in. And since we're going to Florida, I think nothing has changed unless you're present. So a lot of times we have to just show up. And that's what we're going to do is show up. Um, we know that our stand isn't against Florida. It's against the oppressive government or things that are going on all over the United States. And these 38 states or 37 states that we talk about that Dr. Gossard said, and, it, you know, these are these are things that we have to work on as a group. And, and we have to understand that, you know, as they move through DEI and CRT and, and, and all these things that are that are locked into training young people and train people you know, these are things that happen. And if we can't tell our story, who are we? Who are we? If we can't tell people who we are in a, in a historical manner or in a, in a manner of, um, you know, these things happened. And if it's destroying, you know, children's lives that are not of color, I, I don't think so, but, you know, well, let's, as we move on, we just need to make sure that we make ourselves present educational workshops um, when we go to Florida, we're going to do, we're going to provide free eyeglasses for probably over a hundred indigent, indigent people with VSP. And these people are people of color that we're giving free eyeglasses to. We're going to, we're, we're going to, we can also buy banned books from Barnes and Noble if they're there. We can visit an African-American research library in, in Broward County. We can go to and, and as we conduct our educational classes there. So we've got all of these things that, that, that we're looking at and we want to make it an open area and a loving thing that happens. And, and I think that this is where we're lacking. And I think it's super important that we just, you know, we, we all kind of fight together. So that's, that's what I feel in the end yeah, I way. appreciate that. Thank I you. I appreciate that, Dr. Jones. Dr. Pepper. Now, of all the organizations, the Association for Schools and Colleges of Optometry, this is something where all the different colleges come together. And when you have these type of decisions, obviously, it can affect every one of them. As the head of the Diversity and Cultural Competency Committee, how do you respond and navigate these conversations? Thank you, Dr. Harewood. Um, It's tough. Um, 
when you're standing on equity and you're standing on inclusion and saying, hey, this is important and this is how we advance the profession. This is not only how we help to minimize health disparities, but to have a better educational environment for our students and to increase the um, patient outcomes and optometry as a whole. So when you're standing on those sort of values and you have this anti-DEI legislation that comes out, it kind of puts a pause on you a little bit. And so um, what we want to do is if this is the case, we are going to abide by the law and we're going to support every school and college of of optometry that's going through these particular issues. Um, But we want to also focus on areas where uh, we are able to focus on or have highlight um, ways where we can still support minoritized students Um, and faculty and staff, but within the confines of the law. And what I mean by that is um, focusing on belonging, right? Focusing on um, access, things of that nature to where you will still be able to um, highlight that we still welcome everyone um, to be a part of the schools and colleges of optometry, to be a part of the optometric profession, but we have to do it within these particular confines. Um, we are not happy about where we are right now, but we want to do things strategically so that the drop that we've seen in California, that hopefully we can um, combine strategies so that the percentages will not be as dramatic. We're already at low levels already. And with just when they're talking about the pipeline to college, right? And how there's a drop off in regular admissions to college. And so, and then of course that trickles down to professional school. And so now we have to um, find ways to stand out, find ways to say, hey, we're included as inclusive as possible within the the state that you are uh, residing in. And we wanna make sure that each and every school of optometry has the tools and resources that they need to navigate those spaces. And if it means, I think I said this on the other call, we just need to sit and talk, (laughs) then let's sit and talk like we're doing here today. Because when you know that you're not the only one and that other schools have gone through this, such as California, and how we can look at things that they didn't, that um, we can improve upon and things that we can be more innovative in, in reaching those students by increasing the touch points. And when I say touch points, what I mean by that is you have your normal recruitment, um, um, your normal recruitment schedule or your normal recruitment techniques and tactics, right? Well, if you're not able to do things with that, with that um, uh, anti-race or race neutral um, admissions, then you have to do other things to uh, laser in and focus on groups that you want to become a part of your organization. Not only with that, once they get there, how do you talk to them about um, the history of health disparities, right? And how that affects patients and why some patients may appear non-compliant, but it may be because you haven't connected with them culturally, right? And so if we put it in a manner in which that we can um, deliver the information that it's not um, making anyone feel bad or anything like that, but more so just giving the facts. I will tell you that... um, a couple of weeks ago, we went on our family vacay with um, my um, my sister's family, my family, and then my parents. And we went on a civil rights tour, right? And it was the rite of passage for our my nieces and nephews and my son because they hadn't had the uh, civil rights talk. So a lot of that stuff was difficult, right? But if you have the support to talk about it there, it helps to navigate those particular spaces. So when we have to talk about that sort of thing with our students, you're not doing it to condemn anyone, but you're doing it to help them um, be better clinicians and persons as a whole. So that way, hopefully um, we will uh, have resources to support each schools and college of optometry for things of that nature.
Oh, thank you for that. And given the issues with the pathway to optometry, I think that's critically important that you're saying, especially given that we have seen a significant decrease in the number of Black applicants to optometry school to the effect of 12%. And that's even before any of these things are happening. So very important stuff. I'm going to pass things over to Dr. Ramsey to give commentary on the exact same thing. With Black Eye Care perspective, you have the 13% promise, variety of different initiatives. How do you continue to do those things in this particular climate? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. And thank you for SUNY even still putting this on. You know, I was concerned that they may have canceled this uh, in, in, in the face of the legislation. And I commend them for saying, no, we're going to stand up. And it's still important to have the conversation. Um, Black Eye Care pr perspective was started when we said there needed to be a change. And the problem was we sat down and went through ASCO's website that had all the numbers and we could see the numbers of Latinos going up. We can see the numbers of other minority groups going up, but the numbers of African-Americans were stagnant, right? And Black people needed something that was pinpointed and targeted towards them. So if we go back to underrepresented minorities as the conversation we're having, inner city youth as a conversation we're having, we're going to leave those African-Americans right there where they were before we started this. You know, the numbers were exactly the same for 10 years. Black Eye Care Perspective got founded. We started, we started going to the schools. We went and handpicked the students and says, I want to see you. And we says, no, we're not going to leave you. I'm going to hold your hand all the way through the process. I'm not going to let you fall. I'm going to let you go. And those students says, you see me? You think I would be a good optometrist? Yes, you. And I'm going to call you and I'm going to text you and I'm going to email you and I'm going to come to your house. And now the numbers start going up. If we go back in the opposite direction, I, I fear for what's going to happen. But I also feel like in in light of whatever may happen, we're having the conversations about could have, would have, should have here. But it's happy, I'm happy that we're having it in the light of anything that comes after this. If you tell me that to make a diverse class, I'm no longer going to be able just to look at a checkbox but I'm have to actually interview that student and ask them about their story. I'm not necessarily mad about that. I don't necessarily look at that and say, that's the problem. Because now you're gonna have to go and interview that, stu that student and find out about their, about, about their past, find out about where they came from, find out about their story. Because if I sit down with that student and I find out that they worked 40 hours a week while they were in school, they did their homework at Starbucks because that's the only place that they could get Wi-Fi from. And this other student had a tutor all the way through school, and they went to private school all the way through school. And two 3.0s are not the same, because now I've heard the story. The effort that you take to get to that 3.0 also makes a difference. If I worked 40 hours a week and you didn't, and we both have the same grades, that's not the same, that's not the same 3.0. And when you hear, when you hear the stories from those students, you then can use that to form your class. And it doesn't have to be a checkbox. Yes, it's going to be more work on the schools. I get it. But I don't necessarily see that should be a stumbling block. If you are serious about what you said you were going to do, if you're serious about the diversity, we're going to have to get over the stumbling block and say, OK, this is a problem. I agree. I don't like it. But now this, this is the new rules. Let me find out how to excel within the rules, within the confines. We're not going to do anything illegal. We're not going to do anything that, that doesn't stop the rules. But if I have to go and find those students and drag them into my college, the, 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 the rules do not say you can't go and try and get black students to come to your school. It, it, what they're trying to say is you can't only use a checkbox to say that person should be eligible and that person shouldn't. So you shouldn't get scared off by saying, you know what, I got to do a little bit more work. And Black Eye Care Perspective is here. We're not going anywhere. The, the same board that has been here since we started is the same board that's here right now. And I talked to them before this. And we're not scared. We're not going nowhere. We're ready to do the work. We're ready to roll up our sleeves. We're ready to work with any organization or school that wants to do the work and wants to find out a way. Okay, how do I do it within this framework? Let's take out the playbook. Let's go figure it out and let's find a workaround. Because the answer cannot be do nothing. That's not the answer. I'm not going to allow that answer. I'm not going to accept that answer. I'm going to call everybody out that says do nothing. That's not it. We can do it. It's just a matter of saying, what is the playbook? What is the rules? Find the workaround and tell the students, I still see you. I still want you. Your story matters. Your journey matters. And how you got to this, this stage, how you got to this seat to be sitting in front of me for the interview. Okay, I understand where you've been. Let me hear your story. 
why do you want to be here? Why do you want to be an optometrist? And let that student tell you and let that determine how you want to how you want to proceed forward. But I think we can still do it. We put black in the name of black accurate perspective on purpose because we wanted to go after the targeted group that was the problem. Because the other groups were going up. If you look at the ASCO numbers, the other groups were going up. The only group that wasn't going up was black people. So you had to get a targeted plan. You can't just say all boats, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. Some people got holes in their boat and some people don't even have a boat at all. So you have to have some sort of plan to say, how am I going to go after those people? And no matter what the ruling is, I know we can do it. I still have the expectation that the, the, the numbers are going to continue to go up because I'm going to hold everybody accountable and we're all going to commit to actually going and saying we got to find another way within the rules, not illegal, within the rules, you can still do it. Now, before I bring on our deans and presidents, can you still have a 13% promise given uh, the confines? Great question. Well, Be the 13% promise, there's no quotas in a 13% promise. It's just aspirational. It's not saying that it has to be this number or that number. The 13% promise is saying, hey, we can do better. These are the numbers that are out there. I want us to commit to doing better. I want us to commit to increasing the numbers 1%. I want us to commit to say, you know what? We can do better. But it isn't about a quota. It isn't about anything. That's you know, that's why we, we sat down, we had lawyers, AOA's lawyer helped us out by going through and looking through it and going through it and editing uh, the 13% promise. There is no quota. There is no numbers. It's just in the title saying, hey, we, we can do better as an organization. We can do better as an industry. We can do better as schools. We can do better overall, realizing that these people are being missed. These people are, are being left out of the conversation. So I don't see the 13% promise going uh, anywhere. Uh, when you actually look at the wording in the 13% promise. Thank you for that. And thank you to the organizations for answering those questions because I know that they're not easy. I'd like to now bring on our Dean and our president. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Heath, who is the president of SUNY College of Optometry. And I would like to bring on Dean Keisha Elder, who is the Dean of the University of Missouri St. Louis College of Optometry, the first black female Dean of an optometry school. So with that, we've had a lot of people express different opinions about this, uh, the issues that we're facing, the headwinds, but as leaders within the profession at academic institutions, how do you respond or how do we move through or even change our language But when we talk about DEI in optometry? And I'd like to have uh, Dean Elder, would you like to comment first? Sure, thank you, Dr. Harewood. Um, so, you know, this the, these times right now are, are, are just interesting and sometimes it can be not defeating, but it can be discouraging because we're trying to do things to make the environment, to make healthcare better for everyone. And then sometimes it, it seems like there are roadblocks that are put in the way. But I think as I look, as, as the leader of, of an optometric institution, I think one of the first things you have to do is you have to look at your policies and your procedures that are in place. You have to see if there are any potential issues that may um, occur if there is the passage of any um, DEI legislation, whether it be statewide or something that is federal. It is important that you consult with your legal counsel, that you talk to your, um, your faculty and your staff to make sure that everybody has a clear understanding of any state bills and, and, and a clear understanding of any potential um, um, outcomes of the, the Supreme Court decision so that you can not necessarily have an, 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 a fully vetted plan in place, but knowing the way that you can pivot and shift to make sure that you, while you are always standing within a confine and operating within a confines of law, but make sure that you still are able to be intentional about making sure that you have an environment that is inclusive, that is representative of, of everyone that we need to reach in our optometric institutions. Absolutely, now thank you for that. Dr. Heath, how do you respond in this, in this current climate? Well, it's interesting, and, and I think it's been a great conversation thus far. There have just been some, some fabulous comments. 
Um, and, and certainly it's clear, and it, I think it's changed in the last few years. Um, there, I do believe there really is a profession-wide commitment to doing better. Um, clearly optometry was not doing well. It was not a priority or as big of a priority as it should be, although among some institutions, it may have been more of one than others. Um, Dr. Elder, I may think, uh, certainly gave some, some good uh, thoughts in terms of thinking about the practical response and how do you respond immediately to navigate um, a complex structure. Um, it's interesting. Um, I was the one, you know, I guess, who went and sought panelists and had conversations with those who felt uncomfortable. Um, you know, and, and probably more than the SCOTUS decision, uh, the DEI or anti-DEI legislation was really where the chilling effect was coming from the most um, and the anxiety and uncertainty um, in, in so far as many of the anti-DEI initiatives uh, fall under the rubric of freedom of speech. Um, it appears that it's anything but you know, in, in terms of the way the, the impact is. Um, I think every one of our programs across the country is actually going to be dealing with a very unique environment. Um, those of us who are parts of public systems, uh, you know, are going to be having to certainly look to our system for guidance, you know, and certainly they will want to lead more on a system-wide basis. Uh, the impact, particularly of anti-DEI legislation, um, is much more profound for public universities than it is for privates. Um, and certainly the anti-DEI legislation generally is linked to a threat of funding and, and funding cuts. And, and I think that can become uh, incredibly insidious in terms of the ways in which it's used um, to, to manipulate um, the anti-DEI legislation I, I see as targeting not simply the admissions process or diversity efforts. It really is going to undercut the sense of belonging, um, equity and, and belonging, any kind of sense of inclusion that, that the institution is your home. So it will have, I think, profound effects on where students go, um, where they think about going, where they feel comfortable going. Um, you know, Dr. Ramsey, um, you know, I think uh, voiced a little bit of what we all feel, which is um, you got to find a way. You know, you, you've got to make this work one way or another. And I, I kind of want to throw out one other question. In some ways, it would I'd love to, you know, get maybe further in the program from, from our attorneys. Um, if you go back to the comments by Dr. Contreras, um, and, and actually Dr. Gossert, uh, both focused on population health and the importance of diversity in improving population health. Uh, most of the court decisions to date uh, are focused on diversity as providing a better educational environment, um, an educational benefit um, for the community. Uh, I do think as a graduate institution and for doctoral health care, we're different. Um, the reason for diversity, yes, it makes for a much more uh, vital community, a uh, much more dynamic community. Um, you know, uh, I just think a much more inclusive community. But, you know, why do we need it? Uh, a lot of the need is to better population health. And so if the health of the citizens of the United States are uh, a critical interest of government, um, isn't diversity a critical component of assuring healthcare outcomes for our patients. Um, I don't know that it would succeed, you know, but you know, it would be interesting to know whether uh, population health as a justification for diversity would fare any better than simply diversity for the sake of education. Um, but you know, when I look at where we are, um, we're in New York. Um, our chancellor, you know, was secretary of education under Obama and is deeply committed to diversity, inclusion, uh, equity uh, issues and outcomes. Um, and we will certainly be looking to him, you know, and to central administration for guidance um, as we go forward. 
But um, I think every one of our institutions is going to do their utmost to still maximize um, the programs that they can within the limits of the decisions and the, the laws of the given states. Now, I, that's an exceptional question about population health, and I want to bring on our, our lawyers in just a second. But before I do that, as leaders of institutions in higher education, how do you think this affects morale? And how would you recommend that you even motivate people to keep wanting to do this work, given the significant headwinds? And I'll put that either Dean Elder or Dr. Heath. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I can tackle it first, if you don't mind, Dr. Heath. You know, I, I think it's a really great, great question because at my previous institution, I was our director of DEI. So um, the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are, you know, deeply embedded in my psyche. And then, you know, those of us who are underrepresented minorities know the um, challenges that can occur when you are navigating an environment where you are often in spaces where you feel like, like you're alone. So I think when it comes to motivation morale, one of the um, most important things is to be able to have honest conversations with your faculty, staff, or your students who are having concerns to make sure that they're able to have a, a safe space, a sounding board to, to express their frustrations. But I also think it's important to let everyone know that you are still committed to having an inclusive educational environment because we all know that um, health outcomes and, and, and creativity and, and productivity is better when we are in these more diverse and more inclusive environments. So if you um, share your, your plans for how you're going to navigate whatever the, um, the outcome is and how you're still um, committed to making sure that you have the types of environments that, that you are, that you want to have, and they know that, that the train isn't stopping, that you're still moving forward, but you're just taking, you know, somewhat of, of a little bit of a different left to right turn. I think that those are some ways that it will, that you are able to, you know, keep your faculty, staff, and students on board and still make meaningful change. No, thank you for that. Dr. Heath? No, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, it's hard for me to understand how anybody can oppose the concept of inclusion and belonging. Um, you know, and, and I think I became much more sensitive to the overall issue, you know, as I listened to our students and realized that some of them did not feel like they belonged. Um, that drives me crazy. You know, I, I want every member of our community to feel like this is their home and, and we are their family. Um, you know, it, I don't know. I don't, I'd like to think that a commitment, not only to all of these issues, but a commitment to inclusion um, for all students and a commitment of resources to assure a feeling of inclusion for all students. It may be that resources go in different directions because different people feel different ways. Um, but it's really hard to understand how a program that looks to provide uh, a proper atmosphere and support for learning um, can be undermined, you know, by legislation, um, you know, and so to me that that still remains probably the one to tackle. And so when you talk about the morale of the community, I think I agree. With Dr. Elder's correct. You know, you've got to you've got to have the commitment. You've got to have the commitment from the top, and and you've got to make sure that everybody understands um, what your values are. Um, you know, it's, it's probably the other side, which is the recruitment process and the admissions process is, is how do you make sure that the students you're talking to and recruiting know what kind of an environment they're going to be in when they arrive. Absolutely. And with that, I'd love to invite Wendy and Professor Northern, if you don't mind coming back on to discuss if you have a response or something to say regarding that population health piece, whether or not that would be a good way to tackle some of these issues. And uh, Wendy, can I start with you? Oh, you're muted. Of course I am. Okay, 
So I, what I was saying was um, that I think Dr. Heath makes a very good point. Um, you know, but, but how we move forward will depend very much on what the decision says. So, you know, if the court sort of takes the position that there's not a compelling interest in building a diverse undergraduate environment, which is what these cases dealt with, then the door might be open to make the argument that, well, th this is apples and oranges. We're not talking about an undergraduate environment. We are talking a bit about serving the healthcare needs of a diverse population for which we may need diverse healthcare providers. So, you know, again, not having the benefit of knowing what the, what the court is going to say, um, you know, we're somewhat limited, um, you know, in, 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 in what we can predict. But I think the facts, you know, may be very closely tied to the facts of the case before us. And again, as Dr. Northern said, there may be more, you know, broad pronouncements, um, you know, whether in the majority or concurring opinions that might give us a little bit of a roadmap as to um, how much further, you know, students for fair admissions or other groups may seek to extend whatever ruling the court actually issues. Now, I invite Professor Northern if you'd like to comment on that or if you simply think that Wendy took care of it, it's completely up to you. I think Wendy took care of um, it completely, but I would add that one of the things that I think schools will need to be mindful of is that the response back will be, um, so you can, can you demonstrate that the diverse people that are coming into the profession are serving the diverse population, if that's your rationale, or are they pursuing the same kind of um, professional opportunities that a majority person would, or um, what evidence do you have that um, a majority person, you know, the evidence in terms of um, why we need diverse individuals in particular health-related professions, and that may differ from one profession to another, or are you getting people to um, actually serve those communities? Uh, I'll, use, uh, I'll use kind of law as an example. We sometimes have students, and this is not race or ethnicity related, but we'll come in um, who have grown up in much smaller communities and say one of the things that they recognize is that this very smaller rural communities have um, a, a incredible shortage of representation from attorneys. But after spending three years in law school and being around people who are going to large firms in large cities and they're concerned about paying back um, significant cost of education, uh, in terms of having a rural clientele, that those things change. And so I think that the, the challenge will be sink, sinking that um, public health argument to efforts that are also being made to make sure that there is some linkage between um, the recruiting effort coming in and the service implementation going out. And I think that kind of challenge is going to vary significantly depending upon where you are, what your population is and that. But I, but if I'm an attorney, that would be the kind of pushback that I would give to that argument is, can you show me that that's actually happening? Yeah, and, and I, I would agree. I, I don't know all of the uh, research in, in this public health arena. And there's there's two elements. One is population health and serving those communities. And I I, I have reason to believe that I, I think there is significant research that shows this to be true. But you're right, the, any argument would have to be rested on good research and good data. Um, the other element which uh, I think is there is often a, uh, whether it's based upon religion, ethnicity or race, um, patient care, individual patient care outcomes are often improved if they are served by somebody with similar characteristics. 
And maybe that's a call to action for those of us who work in the diversity space within optometry and that we have to get that data. Because those of us who look at this data on a regular basis know that the AAMC, the American Association for Medical Colleges, has data that shows that those who are from underrepresented communities actually disproportionately tend to practice in rural areas and disproportionately tend to practice in areas that are underserved. So perhaps that's a call to action for all of us. Now with that, I'd love to invite everybody back at this point, everyone on the panel back to really just have that next step in our conversation. And I would love Dr. Shogate to start us off. How do we move forward from here? What has worked? Is there something that could work? And what should we be focusing on as we move forward in this very kind of confusing space? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I like some of what um, Dr. Ramsey was saying in terms of, you know, we have to keep the ball moving regardless of what, you know, how politics are playing out on the main stage. Um, and some of that includes community partnerships, which, you know, Black Eye Care Perspective would be a community partner and a good example of the work that they have been doing and really educating um, students who are interested in our field about, you know, how our admissions policies and practices are changing so that they're, they're not just looking at um, the old standard of, oh, I need this GPA or I need to achieve this on my um, optometric aptitude testing when some schools have moved that to optional. So, you know, our responsibility is to remove existing barriers that are going to continue to keep or have, you know, historically kept people out. And, you know, while um, the idea is we want to hold those those barriers up and say, hey, well, this has always been the standard, but who was the standard for? You know, I think we have to think about who these barriers were created for, why they were created in the first place, and then start to dismantle them and think about what does, who do we want our, our future doctor to be? So for, again, it's beyond thinking about who do we want our student to be, because they're only going to be student for four years. Who do we want a practicing doctor to be after they graduate? Um, what do we want them to care about? And so those are the kind of things I would like to see in students' applications. And um, the holistic uh, admission processes where we look at um, a person as a whole person and not just by their um, quantitative value on a piece of paper. Those are the things that um, we have to do. It does take more work. And I think where we are is also educating the future generation of doctors that our processes are changing and they should keep us in mind, um, keep healthcare in mind, keep optometry in mind as a place that they wanna go. I think um, being nimble is going to be important. I think optometry is still small enough in terms of a profession to be nimble. And so we need to be um, leaders in that regard. And I think there we have, you know, our major organiza professional organizations represented. And I think, you know, in being nimble, we have to do more than one thing at a time. So while we're in the process of engaging students in a different kind of way, um, thinking about our application and interview process in a different kind of way, and overemphasizing what inclusion and belonging looks like, we also do still have to be able to say, hey, these policies are inherently racist <laughs> and still have the ability to say, you know, you're asking us to be colorblind, you're asking us to be race neutral, but that means you're really ignoring the problem that disparities exist. That it's a, it's a certain denial that I don't think has any place in our healthcare system. So we have to be able to, you know, fight this war on both fronts. Be nimble, make some changes and pivots, dismantle the barriers that are still in existence, and then also call out um, how damaging this is to healthcare, to our society as a whole. Thank you for that. Now, at this point, I would invite anybody to comment if you want to comment after, but if nobody comments, I am going to keep these questions rolling because you know I have questions all day. Um, what Can I say something, Joy? One thing absolutely. I wanted to tag on that Dr. Uh, Shoge talked about so I don't know if you all seen this or not, but the University of Arkansas talked about they dismantled their DEI um, office. 
and what they, the whole university. And what they decided to do was they decided to um, keep the DEI um, individuals on campus, but integrate them into other departments. So some are in student success, some are in student retention, some are in the equity office, all that sorts of things. So it may require us to have people who are trained in DEI, not a particular DEI person per se, that where everything falls on, but each office or each department has people who are well-versed in DEI principles so that um, people can be at the table to say things or to bring up things that people may not think about or the perspective they may not have at the time. So that's one way we can do that. But then also when we get our minoritized students or underrepresented students on campus, how are they treated? Are faculty equipped to make sure that these students are um, uh, feel like they belong or feel like they're included? Um, and do we uh, make it imperative for that. I know that there are some states where you can't mandate mandate training, that's perfectly fine. However, if you see that one doctor or one faculty member is getting doctor of the, oh, the year all the time, and you might ask, okay, what are you doing? And it may be, I'm going to this training or I'm doing this and I'm doing that. That may be a way to emphasize or to highlight that how they belong or how they feel when they walk on your campus is just as important as getting them through the door. And so that's what spreads, right? That's what you get on the different um, um, online, uh, shoot, I can't think of the word, but when people talk about uh, uh, different optometry schools and stuff like that, and they like this and they don't like that or what have you, and they're in these different groups and they talk about it. When you have your minoritized students saying, hey, I love it here because of X, Y, and Z, that's what follows, right? And so if you make it a point to make sure that when they're on campus, this is how they feel, you'll get that reputation. And if all the schools and colleges make sure that we do that, then optometry gets the reputation of, okay, when you go to optometry school, this is how they treat you. I know that optometry is really big about um, when you have a patient in your chair, we get to talk to them a little bit more than other professions and stuff like that. What if optometry school had the um, the reputation of this is how they treat their students when they're in the professional school. Mm -hmm. That's my point. No, I love yeah. those points. Would anyone like to piggyback on that? Um, in, in, in part, and I think it goes also to um, Dr. Shoge's comment. Well, this may be an opportunity for us to really reimagine what we mean by merit. Right, because most of these challenges are based upon the fact that someone is admitted, a person of color is admitted who may not have the same quantifiable kind of IQ, you know, indicators. But we all know that there are a lot of other factors that lead to someone being a successful professional and someone who can relate well to patients, to clients, to other things. And so this may be an opportunity. And, and those type of things tend not to be as associated with um, socioeconomic differences, what you've had an ability to, um, you know, the, all the challenges um, of growing up in some environments that don't have the educational support that others do. Um, the ability to pay for the preparation tests and all those kind of things. So how can we think about those traits, whether it's empathy, whether it's cultural um, competence in thinking about the ability of an individual to be comfortable in and work in an environment that is where they're not, um, uh, you know, they're not in the majority. There's, there's a certain skill set that you develop when you're continually working in an environment um, in which you're facing certain challenges. And certainly that's true. Uh, um, you know, many of, of uh, our, our students of color. So how, how can we think about the, and the things that are important to patient care, right? The empathy, the cultural competence, how can we begin to think about how to identify those in that holistic process that we can say, these are things that we find um, 
are related to merit and that we can identify in our diverse students in the same way that we can identify them in majority students. But if we're focusing more of our attention on those as being important parts of what we want in our institutions, that may mitigate to some extent the disparity that is arising out of focusing in on the standardized test in the GPA and the GPA without context. I think that, um, Dr. Ramsey talked about a 3.0 from somebody who's been able to, to you know, uh, pay for all the tutoring and the resources versus someone who's working 40 hours a week in an effort just to survive is a very different number. But that person who gets the 3.0 because they're doing everything else they need to survive and they're still being successful to that brings a lot of different things in. So just how can we rethink merit in a way that doesn't um, run afoul of whatever restrictions um, arise over the next days and weeks and months um, mm -hmm. and, 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 still reach, and still reach the populations we're attempting to reach. Absolutely. Could, Does anyone else want to go ahead? Dr. I'd like to ask Dr. Shoge a question um, in California, um, because certainly, you know, in our admissions process, we do certainly look at non-metric variables um, in terms of somebody's preparedness for optometry school. It, it gets a little bit to that redefining of merit. Um, how much is it, how, I guess, how uh, in, in the admissions process in California, I don't know how strong the guidelines are for what you can and cannot do. Um, you know, is it supposed to be virtually a blind decision process where you don't even see the candidate? Um, how do some of these non-admissions tests, non-GPA factors get considered in the California system? So to kind of answer your first question in terms of how stringent it is, you, we we have to really be careful and thoughtful and mindful of, of um, this proposition that is in place because we don't want to be the one that's like, that's called out for breaking the rules. So, you know, the conversations that happen in, you know, the admissions office, um, a lot of, you know, we're checking each other. Can we say this? Can we do this? Let's run this by the law team. And, you know, so I think we are very sensitive about um, what we do and, and can't do. Um, but also some of those proxy factors or proxy measures, which you all have alluded to in terms of using socioeconomic status, uh, or family income, neighborhood circumstances, what was their school like, what other disadvantages um, show up in their background, those are all part of the holistic review process. And so what we do is we've kind of separated our admission and our interview teams. And so there's a first kind of red flag review where um, those are primarily um, the staff in um, our admissions and student affairs office who review the numbers, if you will, of, of the, the students and just getting a basic idea of who do we think um, would be able to um, stand up to the rigor of, of the curriculum. Then when we get into the faculty and peer interviews, so um, a current student is paired with faculty and they actually do the interview process, they are blinded to those um, qualitative values of a student's application. So they don't know what the GPA is. They don't know what their OAT score is if they submitted their OATs. Um, and that's so far been a good way to keep those processes separate. And then finally, the admissions committee looks at the whole um, package, you know, the initial review, the interview, and then make a decision about the, uh, the admission of the student. So that's been our um, process. Um, we also are trying to do annual trainings with our admissions committee, with our interviewers, um, just so that we all stay abreast of what it is what we're trying to do here. And um, that has been part of my work. No, that's great. I think that definitely answers the question. Did anyone want to comment before I move on to, okay. Um, so for those uh, organizations that seek partnerships 
and have connections and the way that we work together. Is there any thought about how we seek partnerships or how we move given the current legislation? And let me, Dr. Ramsey, any thought about that? And I definitely, Dr. Gossard, I'm going to pass things to you too. Both of you. Perfect. Um, thank you. Uh, yes. At Black Eye, Black Eye Care Perspective, we have been very thoughtful about partners. I've been on Zoom calls just like this with people saying, hey, I want to sign your 13% promise. And I ask them why. And they have no idea. They have no answer. They want to do it for marketing. I said, I'm not here for marketing. I'm not here for you to ask to use our logo on your website to make you feel good. That's not what it is. You have to say, I want to do the work. Why do you want to do the work? We've had companies that want to do stuff with us. And we says, hold on. You're talking about 13% promise, but your whole executive team is white. You haven't even tried on your own. I said, you got to fix your own house first before you start saying, oh, I want to support schools and this, that, and the other. And you don't have a single minority in your, in your C-suite, any minority. So you can't say, I'm going to be supporting the schools and I'm going to be supporting all these other people. And I want to see so much diversity over there, but you don't care enough to see diversity and the people that are giving you ideas to help your company grow. You don't see value in the people that are around you to say, you know what, diverse ideas and those people might help our company get better and go forward. So we've, we've helped companies and I'll leave them out, but we've helped numerous companies find executives, find advisory board members, um, find uh, sales reps. Have, we've done a lot of stuff and we've left some of that you know, behind, behind the scenes. But um, and say, okay, after you've done the work, now we can talk about a 13% promise. Because the promise out there, you got to promise it to yourself first. So we've had we've turned down more companies than we've accepted for people that wanted to get involved and wanted to be involved because they couldn't tell me a, a, a fair why. Why do you want to get involved? Why do you all of a sudden want to do this work? We're, we're, we're not here. We never were created. We never were started for you to use us for marketing. They're like, oh, we saw you on Roland Martin and we saw you on this show. Can you get us on there? Why? What am I going to say when we get on there? You got to want to do the work. So I think you should screen people. You should find out the why. Why do you want to get involved? Is it a part of you? Is it a, you know, when I go on your website, when I go on your core values, you don't even have diversity on your core values on your website. So if you don't have it on the, at least on the website for fake, then how can you say you want to do it over here? You know, so we totally screen people and said, you know what? This is not a good fit for, it has to go both ways. You know, we want to be able to work with people that want to work with us and then we can continue to have conversations. We want to have lifelong partners. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I'm not here about getting money for a year or getting something for a small time. I'm here by making lifelong relationships that we're going to continue to work and grow together. And we're not saying we're perfect, but I want to work with somebody that can look, look themselves in the mirror first and say, you know what? Let me work on myself. And maybe can you help? Now, if you come on a call and says, you know what? We need your help to get there. Sure, let's do that. But let's do that before we put a press release out. Are you willing to do the work for a year without nobody knowing that you're doing the work? Or do you want to do the press release before you do any of the work? Because then, then, I, then I know what your why is. Mm -hmm. And we've had companies say, no, 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 that's not what we want. I said, okay, let's think, appreciate it. You might want to find, you can find somebody else. And we've had numerous companies say, you know what? Help us do the work. And I have sat here on my own. I usually see patients four or five days a week. And I sat here on Mondays and I would see company after company and work with them for months here in my office, in this home, work with them, work with their teams. We did diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Dr. Pepper was the one that we went out. We, I started it and I handed the baton to her. Dr. Essence Johnson would go and meet with these companies and do the training and do the tools for those people. And those companies turned around and we go see them and their team is 25% minorities now when it was like 5% before we started because they wanted to do the work. Um, so I'd say, yes, it's fair to screen people. Yes, it's fair to say and I think we should be asking, why do you want to do the work? Absolutely. Dr. Gosser, did you have a comment before we move to it? Yeah, our I'll make it quick. Um, it's hard to follow Adam. He, he, you should have been a preacher, Adam. I think you might have been a miscast, but, but thanks for preaching. You know, um, you know, I say this a lot, but I truly mean it. I appreciate the, the conversation around collaboration. A quote that really resonates with me is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, 
right? So certainly it is that collaborative effort that is that is really going to help us make a difference in this space. And, and certainly the AOA partnering with Black Eye Care Perspectives, um, we're looking at a pilot project where we can focus um, in states that have large Black populations, HBCUs, how can we target and recruit in those, in those institutions and introduce the profession of optometry to, to students that may not be aware of how amazing this profession is? And, and to that end, you know, we also want to elevate the profession um, outside of those spaces. And, and, you know, Black Eye Care Perspectives, we need more Black eye doctors, but they also say we mean, need more eye doctors. And, and so how can we talk about our profession in a meaningful way that will drive applicants to us? And certainly partnering with ASCO and their Optometry Gives Me Life campaign and marrying it however we can with our um, I Deserve More Public Affinity campaign, I think will be very impactful. We partner with our student association to continue with the Opportunities in Optometry grant to help fund applicants from underserved populations, help defray the cost of application to optometry school. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think that we have many more opportunities for collaboration, including building our own leaders from within with our own leadership institute. So um, amen to that joy. And, and the more that we all work together, I think the more that we can travel far together. Absolutely. Now I'm gonna actually hand things back to Dr. Heath. This is our sixth iteration of race and optometry. Our you know, our topics have changed, our environment has changed. What do you say to wrap us up and to bring us into hopefully, fingers crossed, <laughs> next year's seventh race and optometry series? Well, it, it's very interesting. First, I, Dr. Ramsey uh, earlier, you know, said thank you to SUNY for hosting the conversation. Um, and, and quite honestly, I simply think it's the responsibility of universities to have conversations um, and to deal with these issues. Um, I did come into this this year initially wondering whether we had run our course. Um, this session, once a year around the Juneteenth holiday, was designed to establish an accountability loop, you know, that all of our organizations, our institutions, um, made commitments to DEI uh, several years ago, particularly after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and part of the question was, well, yeah, you talk about these things when things happen. You know, when there's a crisis, it comes high on the radar. Um, but invariably, it seems that it begins to fade and it loses its priority status over time. Um, I want to encourage anybody who has, is listening, um, who's been a participant um, in this, to actually go to the videos where people talk about what they've done. Because um, I think each of our organizations have made significant progress. And you wonder whether the commitment is shallow or whether it's deep. Well, it's been happening long enough that I'm encouraged that it's deep. But I worried that people really weren't interested in what our organizations were doing. Um, and as we pivoted a bit and started talking about the environment and the headwinds, as we call them, um, became a much more interesting conversation. Uh, and it's clear that the SCOTUS decision, you know, which, uh, you know, again, we kept hoping it would come out before this conversation. Uh, they'll probably on this one, it'll be 901 and they'll let it out right after we close down. Um, but um, that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, this, these issues are going to be challenged. There's going to be different court cases. DEI legislation is going to be litigated. Um, there's going to be all kinds of insidious ways that people use financial leverage to try to modify or control behavior. So it's hard to believe that there's not going to be a lot to talk about next year. Um, so certainly my commitment is stay tuned for uh, part seven. Um, we'll have to come up with a pithy title for 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 part seven. Um, so, you know, it's been a wonderful conversation and I hope everybody benefited, both the folks who are on the panel as well as those who are in the wings. Um, I do want to thank you all. You know, I, I really want to thank you all for, for coming together and being a part of this conversation. Um, you know, it, it just gets better every single year. 
And I do want to particularly give a shout out to Dr. Harewood, to Joy, uh, for another fabulous job as our uh, as our MC uh, facilitator. So, you know, thank you. And with that, um, boy, let's all see what happens tomorrow. Absolutely. So thank you to all of our panelists and all of all of everyone in the chat. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Marshall, who I know always has some wisdom to drop on this topic. And it's nine o'clock. So our conversation is over, but hopefully it will continue in our homes and in our academic institutions and in our optometric organizations. Have a good night, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Great talk. Yeah.